Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where we share stories of people conforming to the letter, but not the spirit of a request. And today we have three great stories, so subscribe, hit the like button, and let's begin. The first story, bank employee refused to stamp the document, so I called my boss for help. The second story, I was a decent employee, but they wanted me to resign. I fired myself instead. The third story, I had a fun last day at work, but decided to quit this awful job. Today's first story is… So you're telling me you won't do your job? One of the many tasks that I had to complete in the earlier days of the startup was taking care of the administrative backlog that seemed to pile up constantly. Some of it had to do with classing invoices and organizing papers, but clearly the most difficult, tedious, and time-consuming practice of them all involved company banking. Every time our company wants to do some kind of transaction, usually moving money around within our internal accounts or making a deposit into one of our supplier's accounts, we'd have to print out an official page, sign it, stamp it, and bring it to one of our banks in person to have it scanned by the bank manager himself to their central office. As you can imagine, this always causes great delays and problems for everyone involved. One day after we moved into our new office, my boss hands me some printed out papers to indicate a deposit into some supplier's account. I go to the closest bank, which is a stone's throw from the office. I arrive there to see a long line of people waiting silently and the loud screeching in the distance of a 40-something postmenopausal monster on the phone. The security guard and tellers seemed to be cringing in fear every time the voice cackled and laughed in the distance. I patiently waited in the line until it was my turn. I presented myself to the teller, told her I had two papers to stamp and scan to the central agency. The teller pauses, looks around, nervously sweating, and finally tells me that he would have to get approval. He meekly walks over to the closed door of the bank manager and knocks on it, tepidly, to which the voice from within, annoyed at being interrupted on the phone, replies, send him in. I walk into the office and am presented with the sight of a large and in-charge woman sunken into her office chair behind her counter, jewelry and earrings dangling loudly, while she enthusiastically talks loudly on the phone. I wait for her to finish, looking around for a bit, and when she finally does hang up and sighs toward me with an air of indignation, I present to her the two papers. I need these to be stamped and sent to the central agency per policy. Immediately she starts contesting me, loudly asking how many times I'll be bringing her such papers. I told her that since we just moved into our new office nearby, it'll be at least once per day. That's not possible, she answers. I stare at her and ask her what she means. Well, you know, this stamp that I'm going to put on your paper is a big risk for me. What if your paper never reaches the central bank? I'd get in trouble. Sure, I answer her. I get you. Will you be able to put the stamp and scan it? Well, maybe I can do it just this once, but you know, really, I shouldn't. And I won't do it long term. She's about to stamp it when I remember that my boss always demands proof of deposit for any document, so I ask her if she can give me a POD for this deposit. She immediately gets huffy again and loudly exclaims that she cannot do so. After a bit more back and forth from both of us, me softly asking if she can sign it, and her loudly smirking and exclaiming she can, but can't, I finally ask and say, that's fine then, I just need to take your name for my boss, as we'll most likely be filing a complaint with the central office of the bank. Oh boy, that was a mistake. She immediately gets defensive and screeches out that no, I may not have her name, and to get out of her office immediately. After lampooning me some more in front of the dozens of stunned customers, tellers and the security guard in the lobby, I walk back into the lobby and call my boss. Boss, the bank manager at the bank outlet close to our house doesn't want to scan the paper. I hear more screeching from behind as the banker lady claims that I'm misrepresenting her words. My boss calmly tells me to go back to the office and I understand what she's going to do. Meanwhile, the banker lady tells me to get out of the bank. No problem, ma'am. I will leave. I walk back to the office and my boss meets me there. I explain to her as we drive back to the bank in her car what happened and that the banker lady didn't scan my pages because I was soft-spoken and non-aggressive. She parks the car on the curb, in front of the bank and marches in. Immediately my boss walks over to the front of the line and enters into the banker lady's office, who is back on the phone and probably low-key SH talking. My boss proceeds to absolutely demolish this banker lady, demanding her to hang up, and then going through the names of the CEO and the investors of our company, as well as reciting all her high-placed contacts at the central office of the bank. She says that it's bank policy to bring these sheets to any office, that any office must scan them to the central agency. She then loudly exclaims that she'll be filing a complaint directly with the top customer service rep of the bank, as my boss shows the banker lady his private number on her phone. At first, the banker lady tried to fight back and explain herself, 
but then she just fell into a mortified silence. At the end of it all, she vigorously apologized to me for my inconvenience and started trying to compliment me on my Arabic. This story takes place in North Africa. Sweating and groveling to the max as she scans the sheets of paper, she bows her head to us as we're walking out and tells us that we're welcome back anytime and that she'll be glad to scan anything we bring her. Yes, I'm sure you will, banker lady. I'm sure you will. The second story is, you'd like me to resign? How about I fire myself from this job instead? Part 1. New Job This happened about a year ago now, but I still think back to it from time to time and appreciate how well it unfolded. I work in software and took a job at a small, medium-sized software company in 2018. The company was family-owned and I went to high school with the CEO's daughter. The place itself was rampant with nepotism and the company culture wasn't great. Sexist comments and humorous racist remarks were common, but I needed a job and this was one of the few options I had. My title was project coordinator, but I was quickly relegated to buying lunches for the team and such. At one point when the lottery reached 500 million, the CTO asked me to dress like Randy Savage and get a pool together. I spent a whole day buying lottery tickets. I hated it but kept thinking if I paid my dues, I'd get a shot at some real work and growth. Eventually I got a chance to handle recruiting and doing intro calls for new hires. It was brutal, but yet again I kept pushing through. Part 2. I hate it here. It was a 6 month contract to hire situation and they made me an offer which I was able to negotiate from 40k to 55k, which felt like validation finally. Sadly, nothing changed after this. I kept buying lunches and setting up calls that I wouldn't be included in. Around this time, one-to-ones essentially ended for me. What was a monthly cadence with my boss, the CEO, turned to once every three months, and finally he had me reporting the CEO's daughter, who would then conduct my one-to-ones. I was open about my frustrations, and I was promised that in January 2020, they would move me out of hiring. January came and went. Part 3. Malicious Compliance February and I finally had a meeting with the CTO. I got to his office only to be told that there was no other role for me, and now that we had hired more people, we didn't have a need for my services anymore on the tech team. I pushed harder and essentially the CEO's daughter didn't have faith in me, and that was that. He politely suggested I resign, and they'd give me a letter of recommendation. We went back and forth, and he finally mentioned that there was another opening on another team, but he thought that would be a bad role for me. This is where the malicious compliance comes in. He showed all his hands at that point, and I knew I could make this work for me. The next day I updated my DICE profile, and within 24 hours had two interviews set up. I then told him I needed a few days to think things over, and that I was taking PTO. I went home and waited, watched Nacho Libre and prep for interviews. That day he texted me asking me general work questions. Day 2 he finally broke down and asked over text if I wanted to be let go or resign. He actually wrote that in text form. I told him I was still thinking about the other role, and I hadn't made a decision. I then had dinner with the founder of the company. The other role was on his team. He was the CEO's husband, and he and I always got along. I laid out everything I went through. That night I emptied most of my office, and the next day the CTO called Livid, telling me I was handling this the wrong way, and this was making it difficult for them. Two days later, after using some of my PTO, I walked into the VP of HR's office and told her to fire me. She looked at me confused and said that the manager normally needs to tell her that. I showed her printed out screenshots of our texts and a log of my one-to-ones, citing that if they were firing me for cause, then you'd think this would look more consistent. Fallout. I was fired at this point and I had a job lined up already. Shutdown hit and that offer was delayed, but because I was fired, I could claim unemployment. This hit them and they even tried to claim they gave me severance, but I had all my pay stubs and proved otherwise. The CEO's daughter straight up stopped talking to me, and they ended up giving their office and moving into a co-working space. I get a job as a legit PM at a Fortune 50 software company. I bought a Lincoln. My life is a hundred times better. My parents voted for the first time this year and I went with them. They live close to that co-working space, and with as much salt as possible, I linked up with a few folks I actually liked at the company, and they told me to come over. I spent a half day working in the same space as them, with the biggest grin on my face. And that's how I left my previous company. As a kid, they tell you don't get fired. As an adult, sometimes it's the smartest option. And the last story is… The infamous last day. So I used to work as a games attendant at Six Flags in Jackson, New Jersey. Unlike most establishments, I had no ill will towards most of my peers and supervisors, but lots of bottled up content for the higher ups. They had so many rules and regulations that were tedious and only there because they felt it necessary. One of the big ones they harped on people for were the grooming and uniform guidelines. 
Now, like the proper employee I was, I hit the grind and did as I was told like a loyal subordinate. I have a fairly deep well of patience, and I was only there for the summer so why fuss about it? Flash forward several months into working when a flash flood rips through the county and drowning half the park. I had not prepared for the wet weather and suffered the consequences as every inch of me was soaked, which wasn't a problem except I was only halfway through a 12-hour shift and a stiff breeze kicked up for the whole rest of the day. If there was ever a top 5 for closest I got to being hypothermic, that would have to be up there. Now you mesh all that together with a pay just over minimum wage for 3 years of service, an almost hyperthermic shift, and a lousy paycheck every week. You have the perfect combination for a disgruntled employee. So naturally I thought of different ways to make my last day at work memorable, but what to do? They have rules for everything, and breaking them at bare minimum precludes you from clocking in or getting suspended, to getting fined or fired or arrested. Then it hit me, the perfect middle finger to the higher ups for my last day. So, I took that Ancestry.com swab and figured out more or less everything my parents had told me about my genealogy. I know this sounds off topic, just bear with me. On my mom's side was lots of Viking and German, and on my dad's side was British, Hungarian and Irish. Now being the prideful bee that I am, I naturally had to buy some of the cultural garb my ancestors would have worn, because I figured I had to represent. Which is where this comes full circle. I decided to don my kilt, knee-high wool socks and my flashes on my last day of work. Now bear in mind at this point it's the middle of August in an amusement park. Anyone who's been to an amusement park in ball sweltering heat will tell you it gets a bit steamy, especially when you're in a wool kilt and knee-high wool socks. But like I said I'm a prideful bee, and after sneaking my kilt in my bag through security, I put it on and had at it. The Irish don't do it nearly as often or publicly. Although my kilt is custom made with the colors from the part of Ireland and where my family came from. I'd also managed to mock up a good enough Irish accent, being I'm an American anyway, over the summer and in full regalia went from the beginning of my shift at 4.30 until the park closed at around 11. And just to put some icing on this cake, several full times were patrolling my area that day, of which I made D sure to stand out in the open and be noticed. The best part was I was only breaking trivial rules, nothing worth a fine or an arrest, and the only leverage they had against me was out the window, since it was my last day anyway. Checkmate. But here's the best part. Even though my username is definitely not my actual name, most gamed employees at Six Flags have undoubtedly heard about this. Because like a wholesome properly done joke, it continues to pay dividends. The higher ups were so furious with the stun I pulled that afterwards they tightened the clothing guidelines further still. For example excluding the adornment of fun socks. When I went back with a friend of mine everyone made a comment on it and even employees I had never met before referred to me as kilt guy. It was one of those things where if you did something incredibly dumb they'd have to nab you for it. They didn't threaten you but there's always that one exceptionally dumb person. The good old days. Cheers! Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell button.